Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. These episodes are going to be late because I'm two hours ahead of where this trial's taking place. So testimony typically ends later for me. Then I have to finish up my notes, get my graphics, record, edit. So it's probably going to be a lot of after midnight postings of these episodes, but we will get there. If you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Click that little bell icon. It'll let you know every time something new is posted. Music fact of the day. I love some Jim Croce. Where did he get the inspiration for the song Operator? Well, in 1966, Mr. Croce joined the National Guard in an attempt to preempt the draft. Talking about the recruits, he said some of them were getting these Dear John letters or phone calls. I think it was the most important aspect of the song because it was just so desperate. You know, I only have a dime and you can keep the dime because money was very scarce and precious. And I think if you look at the words to the song, there are so many aspects of our generation that are in it. We are going to jump in. It's going to be a long episode, a lot to cover. The last witness of the day, what a great witness for the prosecution. I spoke too soon when I talked about how nice the defense attorney was because he flipped his lid today. The first witness of the day was Bryce Ziegler. He works in the FBI lab division in firearms and tool marks. He examined the gun that killed Miss Hutchins and also wounded David Souza. When he gets weapons, he doesn't have direct knowledge of where they came from. This was just labeled as a revolver, nothing else. He had no clue that it came from a movie set. They show a photo of the revolver to the jury, and he explains this is a single action revolver, meaning that the hammer has to be manually cocked back each time the shooter intends to fire. He names off all the parts of the gun, the barrel, the cylinder, the hammer, the trigger, and the grip. In order to get this gun to function, you have to load cartridges into the cylinder. And there's two ways you can do that. You can open the loading gate, which gives access to the cylinder, you can also remove a pin that's kind of just above the cylinder. So when you remove that pin, the cylinder comes out, then you can load it. Either way you do it, you have to manually pull back that hammer. And the hammer has a firing pin that's fixed to it. So when the hammer falls, it strikes the primer on the projectile, which causes that gun to discharge. There's several safety notches on the hammer by design. Now, as you start to pull back that hammer, you hear the first click. They call that the quarter cock notch. The second click is the half cock notch, and the third click is that hammer being fully engaged and in position. He explains that if he's pulling the hammer and his finger slips, you would expect one of those two notches to catch it. The gun's designed to only fire when that hammer is fully engaged. He explains further about ways to load the gun. He talks about if the gun is fully loaded, when the hammer is resting on a cylinder with a round in it, the firing pin is sitting right on that primer. The gun is from Pieta, which is an Italian company, and they make replicas of older guns. He did a function evaluation to be sure there were no odd modifications. He also did microscopic testing and accidental discharge testing. For the function exam, he visually inspects the firearm for safety purposes. After that, he'll load it with ammo from the FBI lab and then test fire the gun. He test fired this gun 12 times. He kept the fire bullet and the cartridge case. Those become secondary evidence to be used when he's doing his microscopic examination on the actual projectile that he was sent. He did microscopic comparisons and he was supplied a fire projectile and also a casing to compare to his known sample that he created during the test fires. He also examined live rounds, dummy rounds, rounds supplied by Seth Kinney, who owns that prop warehouse, and also the rounds that came from the movie set. He x-rayed all of the projectiles. Some of those made sounds when they were shaken, but he x-rayed to be sure what was inside and to determine which bullets he needed to disassemble. With the accidental discharge testing, ultimately his question is, can I fire this gun without pulling the trigger? So he simulates the gun being bumped into something to see if it fires. What he did is he takes the gun and gets a rawhide mallet and strikes the gun on six different planes. So he gives an example of a box to compare to the planes. The box has the front and the back, the sides, 
the top and the bottom. And so essentially, he just hits the gun in all of these different areas. The FBI knows this is potentially damaging or even destructive to the firearm, so they have to get permission from the contributor before they can proceed with this kind of testing. He did get it to fire twice. The first time was with the hammer at rest with that loaded chamber. We just talked about how that firing pin is going to sit right on the primer if it's fully loaded. When he hit that with the hammer, it provided enough force to detonate the primer. The second time it fired was when the hammer was fully pulled back. When he got to the rear of the gun, he struck the hammer. The hammer fell, detonated that primer. As a result, some of the internal components of the gun broke to allow that hammer to fall and fire the bullet. He talks about the one quarter and half cocked notches. If the hammer were to fall and there was no damage inside the gun, he would expect the sear, that actually is what makes contact with the hammer, to be caught by either that quarter or half notch to prevent the hammer from falling that way. But because it fired, it led him to believe there was some damage to the inside of the gun. He eventually disassembled the gun to find out what the damage was, and that damage was sustained at the FBI lab and not before. With this gun, if it's in the quarter or half cocked position, it's designed so that you can squeeze the trigger with enough force, it will cause the hammer to fall and release that bullet. He did testing to determine that if he puts the hammer in those two positions and squeeze the trigger, is it feasible for the hammer to fall and detonate the cartridge? In this case, it was not. Now, I think this report is what got Alec Baldwin charged again just last month because it said new reports indicate the trigger had to have been pulled for that gun to fire. That's what he testified to today. So I think we're not only going to see him back at Alec Baldwin's trial, it's going to be a big source of contention between this witness and Alex's defense because they're going to have the argument of the gun was damaged. He took the gun apart. They show a photo after the accidental discharge was complete. He found fractured pieces on the cylinder stop and also on the trigger. But ultimately, his opinion is that this gun couldn't be fired without the handler actually pulling the trigger. They show the projectile that was sent to him. Now, I'm pretty sure they didn't specify, but this has to be the projectile that went through Ms. Hutchins as well as Mr. Souza. It was really damaged. Normally, he would expect to see deep lines defining the rifling. That's when the bullet moves down the barrel of the gun. It puts distinct markings on the casing. This bullet has abrasions, so whatever it came in contact with, it damaged the projectile so badly, it took away those rifling marks. He estimated the bullet was between a 44 and 45 caliber, and the reason it's in between is because lead is a softer metal. Most modern bullets have a harder jacket around it, which is usually copper. It protects the lead core as it starts hitting things. The lead is just more susceptible to damage. He had four bullets submitted. He tested the four components to see if they were live bullets. Well, what are the four components? You have the cartridge case, the actual bullet, the primer, and you look to see if the inside of the projectile has gunpowder. All cartridges had the same color primer shape of the projectile and the same markings on the head stamp. He did the same series of testing with those four components that we just talked about. The difference in the ammunition that was sent by Seth Kinney and the ones from the set were the shape and the design of the bullet. The head stamps had different brand names, the colors of the primers, the finish of the bullet, and Seth's ammo was lead. He didn't disassemble all the bullets sent in by Seth, but he did disassemble all the suspected live rounds that were sent from the movie set. He goes back to the box that was sent to him from the Rust set and shows they're all dummies but one. You can tell by the shape of the bullet, which is different from those dummy rounds. He found four live bullets from the set. Two were on top of the prop cart. One was in that ammo box that was initially stored in the police cruiser when they first got on scene. One was in a holster from inside the church. And unfortunately, the one that was in the gun that hit Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza. On cross, they go through his training. And in his first testing, he determined the gun function normally. He looked to see if there's bulging in the barrel, cracks in the frame when he did that visual exam. The defense says because you didn't open the revolver before the hammer test, can you say those parts weren't broken before? He says he can't say for sure, but it fired normally, so he would think there was no fractures inside. He's asked with FBI standard operating procedure, did he do a drop test? The witness says that that's a subcategory of the accidental discharge test, and they only do that if it's a situation that was reported from the source 
and that wasn't relevant in this case. Now, the defense says the industry standard is the drop test, and the witness says he wouldn't say that, and the industry standard may not be relevant in forensic testing of firearms. He's asked how many times he's used a mallet on a weapon, and he said less than 10, and this time here was the only one he's done it in actual casework instead of training. They go back and forth about the mallet test and how they don't know how much force it took to actually break the gun. The accidental discharge test initially wasn't requested until later on when Alec Baldwin said he didn't pull the trigger. He can't say it's impossible, but his testing showed the gun was functioning properly. The defense says you can't account for all the variables on the movie set or even the ones he's not aware of. The defense also mentions he didn't disassemble some of the rounds sent from the set. He discussed this with the case agent, and due to the number of rounds they sent, they focused on the ones that they needed to take apart, ones that would be a representative of all the other samples. The defense talks about a request for DNA testing. There was a submission to the FBI lab on December 14th of 2021. They show him a report. He asked if certain standards were submitted in this case. The witness said he saw the report. That's not related to his discipline, and it doesn't affect his examination. On redirect, when he x-rayed, he could see indicators of the dummy rounds on x-rays like BBs or holes drilled in the side. There was that one round that looked live, but once they disassembled it, it ended up being a dummy round. That bearing was stuck in there. The next witness is Shannon Prince. She works at the FBI lab. She's a physical scientist, and she works as a forensic examiner in the latent print division. They ask what a latent print is, and that's unintentional prints left from oil and sweat from your hands. She looks at the condition of the evidence, whether it was previously processed in the field and other variables. That helps her decide which test she'll perform. They show an ammo box of 45 long Colt dummy rounds. She tested that box for prints and found three latent prints on there. She compared those to Hannah, Sarah, who was in props, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. There were no positive identifications. She was able to exclude Sarah and Alex. Hannah and David were inconclusive. You can also touch an item and not leave a print. You might have gloves on, too much or too little sweat on your hands. The surface you're touching may be dirty or textured. And if something is overhandled, the prints can be wiped away. Also, environmental factors can determine how good a latent print is going to be. She looked at four different casings. There were no suitable latent prints. It's not unusual. The casings go through heat and friction, which can destroy the fingerprint. And also, you have the very small area down the barrel that the bullet travels through. She also worked in the Las Vegas shooting. And in that, she processed over 6,900 pieces of ammo. Out of all those, she only got 26 prints. That's a 0.38% chance. It's really a low chance to get any print from ammunition. She tested 40 firearms. Only 12% had prints. And out of the 180 magazines she tested, 9.7% of those had prints. On cross, the defense points out she did not get standards from Seth Kinney as far as fingerprints, and also she had a palm print standard for everyone except Alec Baldwin. She said Mr. Hall's and Hannah's prints were not completely rolled right. There was over inking in one area. When they're doing fingerprints and they're doing ink prints, it should be from nail to nail, so side to side. She talks about how now, too, they also do digital prints where you put your finger on a scanner and it does it digitally. Hannah's prints was found on one of the boxes. Some fingers had the comparable area for her to look at. There was no communication with the sheriff's office about the lack of testable prints, but she did put in her report that a new standard would need to be submitted for further comparison. The defense asked if it's likely you can find prints on unfired ammo. She said it's still less than a 1% chance because of the smooth surface and also handling it. He said even if there's a low chance, you still have a chance of getting a print. And of course, she agrees. One box was sent to her from the firearms unit, the previous witness, by the way, and that's kind of backwards. They identified 10 prints on that box, and they found eight of those prints were FBI employees who were contributors. The next witness is Robert Gillette. He works in the FBI explosives unit as a chemist forensic examiner. Y'all, these people are so smart. He conducted testing on ammunition. First, he does a visual exam with a microscope, takes photos and measurements. He also uses a liquid to extract particles to be analyzed. These projectiles came from the prop cart, the holster, a bandolier, and a tray. He said smokeless powder has a disc shape. 
Some look like a donut with a little hole in the middle, and then some are just round and solid. On Cross, he tested 11 different items. The cartridges were not intact when he got them, and the gunpowder had been removed. And the defense just points out that it was that first witness that removed the powder. He can't say what powder came from which specific cartridge. His report was on May 3rd of 2022. They sometimes can determine the manufacturer of the gunpowder if there's enough sample of it. But in this case, he was not asked to do that. The next witness is Geraldine Conway. She works for the FBI as a DNA examiner. She explains how DNA works. It's all very technical, but most of our DNA is the same. But we have short tandem repeats that are different. DNA testing is essentially determining how many repeats someone has in their DNA compared to others. She tested the revolver that was used in the shooting and they did get a profile. Their known samples were Hannah, Alec Baldwin, David Halls, and Sarah Zachary. She got Alec Baldwin's DNA on that gun, and she couldn't say for sure if Hannah's DNA was on the sample. She just wasn't able to get a match. She also reiterates the FBI policy is not to conduct DNA testing on cartridge casings. There's such a low likelihood of getting enough and on ammo, it can be degraded from the heat due to firing, and they don't even do it if it's unfired. So on cross, he asked if it ever happens. Do you sometimes get a print off a projectile? She said maybe in some cases, but it's just not the FBI's policy to even try. He asked about terrorism attacks, and in that case, would they test? And she isn't aware of any cases where they've done that. But the defense says the FBI has the capability, but she again says it's not our policy to test. Also, swabbing would destroy latent prints, so they don't swab for DNA. She did not get a buckle swab, which is a cheek swab to get DNA from Seth Kinney. And he asked if her conclusion was Baldwin was the one touching the gun. She says yes. The next witness, I love this guy. I think the reason that the defense went so hard on him in crosses because his testimony was sincere. He knows his stuff, and we're about to go to school on what it's like to be on a Hollywood set because he laid it down. His name is Ross Ad Diego. He's a dolly grip. He helps the camera department with movement on dollies on cranes and also rigging on vehicles. He explains they had an A camera and a B camera. He was the dolly grip for the A camera. What is a dolly? It's for camera support. Usually it has eight wheels and a hydraulic boom system, and that enables him to boom that camera up and down. I'm pretty sure the first person to invent a dolly was Desi Arnaz on the set of I Love Lucy. On set, he would help the director of photography, in this case, Miss Hutchins, bring the vision to the screen by assisting with camera movement. On Rust, they had a lot of crane shots to show that Western town. There was a lot of dolly moves and constant movement throughout filming, moving in and out of sets to reveal other characters. Camera A wasn't always on a dolly, and that camera can weigh 40-ish pounds, so they would do handheld. He would sometimes have to stabilize the camera guy who would maybe have it on his hip while he's filming the scene. It could be on a rideable crane that could be 20 feet long that would put him up in the air to get wide shots. They were 10 days into filming when the shooting happened. They were doing five-day work weeks, and at some point they went from Tuesday to Saturday. He says he's worked on sets with armorers a dozen or more times. He's a 30-year veteran of the movie industry, by the way. He said armorers are hired because they plan to use potentially deadly weapons on set. The armorer is responsible for any working firearms and ammunitions on a set. There's an objection, so the prosecutor says, excluding the movie Rust, did you notice safety protocols that he himself saw? armorers engage in up until he got to the movie Rust. He said the first assistant director would have some sort of safety meeting or lecture before any firearms are used in a scene. Now, every day they get a call sheet that tells what cast and crew is needed on set, what weather is expected to be, what time sunrise and sunset is, what location they're shooting at, what time you need to be on set. And sometimes they email safety bulletins along with that call sheet. Whatever's appropriate for the day, whether you're having weapons on the set, animals on the set, if there's bad weather headed your way. And the armorer may have something to say like, we're firing blanks or dummies today. He explains that blanks can be dangerous on a movie set. They do have safety gear the crew may use if blanks are going to be fired in close proximity to them, such as hearing protection, safety glasses. They cover the camera operators with special coats that protect against anything coming from the firearm. 
They also protect the cameras. He said it's very important to know what size of blanks will be used so they know what kind of safety gear to have on set. Depending on the firearms being used, a lot of the ones in this movie were old style. You could see if the gun was loaded or not. And if the camera sees the front of the gun, the audience would see the gun was loaded. He said props put the BBs in there in the dummy rounds so that the cast and crew know the rounds are safe on set. The crew has a union for themselves and the actors have the Screen Actors Guild. The safety bulletins would be typically generated by someone in production. Hannah would not have been responsible for that. But there was a difference on how safety bulletins were handled on the set of Rust compared to other sets he's worked on. Usually in the emails, it would say to refer to the bulletin and then there are different numbers with different safety bulletins, and then you read what's relevant to you. He doesn't remember getting any safety bulletins on the set of Rust. On other sets, they would have safety meetings, but back to the armorer. He said typically they're the most uptight and anal retentive people on set because they have people's lives in their hands. They don't typically have friendly conversations. They don't joke around, sort of stick to themselves. He said he finds a lot of armorers are former law enforcement or military with backgrounds in firearms. They talk about Hannah's behavior compared to other armorers he's worked with. He said she wasn't as serious. She wasn't as professional as he's accustomed to working with. And he gives an example of walking by her cart. There were firearms, bandoliers, ammo belts, all unsecured. He also said he hasn't seen an armorer pull loose ammo out of a fanny pack. He said usually it's a labeled box or some kind of plastic container they keep that in. And also on the cart, loose items are out of the ordinary. They usually come out of a loft bag or container. Some armorers have a wheel around cart with locks. They have the names of the characters on different drawers and that cart would stay under lock and key. The unattended weapons concerned him. He said it was inappropriate and not ordinary. He said they're not completely under the armorer's control if they're not under lock and key. When the armorer brings a firearm to the set, the first assistant director would notify the cast and crew of that, even if it's loaded or not. The armorer would then invite cast and crew to inspect, looking through the barrel, shaking that round. And then the armorer will explain the actor is going to fire X number of blanks of a certain caliber and make sure everybody in the area has the appropriate safety equipment. He said there have been accidents in the past when the barrel wasn't cleaned and when a blank was fired that debris can injure or kill someone on set. On Rust, they were never invited to look down the barrel as far as he remembers. He said it concerned him because they call them safety checks for a reason. The crew is not allowed to touch the firearm or the ammunition, but they can ask the armorer to show them it's one round or the other. The way the dummy round is manufactured, there are indicators it's not alive. We know now the hole, the primer's already struck or it's just not even there. You shake them to hear them rattle. And the armorer would be the one to shake the dummy rounds if a crew member asked to hear that. The gun is usually loaded by the armorer on set in front of cast and crew within moments of the safety check. And that's also when the cast and crew can inspect it. Some armorers would even put the firearms in the holsters just right before they started filming. He said, as far as he saw, Hannah didn't load the ammunition on set with the exception of when they were doing resets. A reset is where you call cut and then you turn around and quickly jump right back in and start from the beginning and film that scene again. You don't stop the camera. But he said she would essentially be put in a position to have to load in front of the cast and crew in that instance. Both the first assistant director who was in charge of safety and Alec Baldwin were the ones who would have the scene reset, which would force her to reload while on set. He didn't see Hannah take any steps to slow things down if she felt she was being rushed. He said he was present for every scene, but maybe not every take within those 10 days of filming. When they would roll the camera and yell cut, that's a take. They do multiple takes for different reasons. One could be the actor isn't happy with their performance, just to change things up. The lighting isn't right, you could imagine. He said he was there for around 95% or more of the takes on set though. The armorer is usually never out of eyesight of whatever weapons they're in charge of. And on Rust, Hannah wasn't always within eyesight of the firearms on set. He was on set when there were accidental discharges. The first time came from Sarah Zachary, the prop master. She was loading or unloading a handgun unannounced to any of the crew or cast and that firearm discharged. The witness was within feet 
of that when it happened. He said that she seemed very spooked, and when that firearm discharged, it was very near her foot. It made a bang. He doesn't know if it had a bullet, but it spooked the crew and the horses on set. On other movie sets, he's never seen the prop master loading or unloading the guns. The second discharge happened when they were in a cabin set with Alex Stump Double. There was going to be gunfire in the scene. Hannah was inside the cabin with the double preparing him with his gun. And unannounced to anyone, the gun just discharged. The time between the two accidental discharges were within an hour of one another. Accidental discharges aren't common. He doesn't think he's experienced one on any other set. The armorer is responsible for those accidental discharges, and it caused him concern, so he told the first assistant director, Dave Halls, and his second-in-command on set about those worries. He expressed his frustration that safety was second to the production clock. He said Mr. Halls ignored him and walked away. He then went to Mr. Halls' second second and expressed his anger and frustration and asked this be put on the production report. That's essentially a diary of everything that happens throughout production on the film set. So the day of the shooting... He was working on set, and he got there between 6 and 7 in the morning. When he arrived, he learned the camera department had decided to leave the show due to the safety concerns they had. He said the repercussions of that threw them all into just the state of chaos than they already were. He said at times they were just moving at ludicrous speeds to race the production clock, and they had time constraints with a very ambitious schedule. In the film industry, to make your day means that if there's four scenes on the call sheet and they've got a certain time frame to complete it, and they do, they've made their day. Otherwise, if they don't, production has to figure out where to fit those scenes in to be able to finish them at a later time. On the set of Rust, they were restricted by the budget for a certain number of days. He talked to Miss Hutchins about not having enough time they needed to finish the ambitious schedule with only two cameras. But he said they all count on each other when things are moving this fast. The morning of the shooting, they were filming with some kids. They had animals on set. He said they had horses and farm animals. The lawmen rode into town in pursuit of Alex's character. That day, they also had a number of animal wranglers on set. They finished filming that scene in the morning. The next scene was at the church. The part of the story, he explains what's happening here because we see some clips later on. Alec Baldwin's character, Heartland Rust, had been injured in one of the shootouts, so he finds this church to hide out in. He knows he's being pursued, and he hopes to get the draw against the lawmen when they enter the church. Prior to lunch, they had filmed pieces of that scene, and so they play clips from the scene. If you're on YouTube, I'm going to play that now. The first clip you see, the sound slate, is the thing that makes the clapping noise. It's used in editing, and it helps keep track of scenes and takes. There's a lot of different things on that clapper. He explains that the letter A is for A camera, which was his camera. Another number represents notes to the script supervisors that they use for editing and writing. There's a time code on there, and depending on how the sound mixer and production want to keep time, it could show the elapsed time of when filming began for the day. It could be the date and the time. His understanding is they were filming Baldwin laying in wait for the lawman pursuing him and catching up to him. They were going to film an extreme close-up of where you see his character contemplating pulling the gun. So he puts his hand in his jacket and starts to draw the firearm. Once they had that piece filmed, they were going to do a turnaround. And what that is, they would just film from behind Baldwin to get the lawman coming in. The witness said that Baldwin always wanted to use his hero props, which is the real gun. A cold gun on set means the armorer and the first assistant director have deemed that firearm to be safe. So when you hear clear, you assume that the trigger could be pulled and nothing would happen. He said the morning in the church it was uneventful other than just the chaos of the cameramen and women walking off set. After the takes, they broke for lunch. He said they took about a half hour, maybe a little longer because with lunch, it took a little bit of a van ride to get there. They got back to the set around 2 p.m. They used a steady cam, which is fixed to the camera operator, but the shot wasn't working. So the witness brought the dolly in to give them a more stable platform. And he said it takes a few minutes to switch that out. I've been on some sets. It does. It's Nothing's quick. The witness is getting the dolly close to the pew where Baldwin was sitting. He was working with the camera operator and Miss Hutchins. Miss Hutchins was talking to them about what she wanted. 
and she was starting to prepare for the turnaround shot. The witness was trying to find the shot that best told the story in that moment. That shot was going to be the extreme close-up of Baldwin starting to draw his weapon, and his cut would be when the audience sees that gun leave the holster. The turnaround shot again, would show the lawmen enter the church, and then the shootout would begin. When they were blocking this scene, the cameras weren't rolling, so he didn't see the interaction between Hannah and Dave in the church, but he could hear her say the firearm had been checked before lunch and locked up during lunch. The first assistant director called out cold gun, meaning safe, not going to fire, and the witness returned to helping Miss Hutchins and someone named Reed find that shot. The witness wasn't worried about Hannah not checking since lunch. He said typically it's checked when it's brought on set, even if it had been checked before. The gun was then in Mr. Baldwin's holster on his left side. He didn't see Hannah in the church after lunch. The witness and Reed were looking over Baldwin's right elbow or maybe his bicep trying to find an angle where they could see his hand transition from his lap to under his coat where that holster was. It would show the gun sliding out of the holster and the audience would then realize that Rust is about to shoot the lawman. They had one camera in the church and it was within a foot of Alec Baldwin. Miss Hutchins was directly in front of Baldwin talking to her gaffer, Serge. A gaffer is the head of the lighting department. Miss Hutchins and her gaffer were standing behind a pew and they had their lighting set up, but they were discussing what they were going to do in the scene. Now, the witness says Ms. Hutchins and Serge often talk in Russian or Ukrainian since they're both natives, so he really wasn't sure what they were discussing. He explains the director would sometimes be watching from Video Village. We talked about that yesterday. It's where you can watch the filming remotely without being on set. He said some directors prefer to be in Video Village and some prefer to be right there in the middle of it. Once they get everything set up, the scene starts and Baldwin is sitting on a pew with his head down. You see the top of his cowboy hat. You hear Jensen Ackles off camera. He plays a lawman telling Russ to get up nice and slow and drop any weapons he has. They start and stop this scene several times. You see the effects department coming in to spray what they call atmosphere. It's like dust in the air that makes the scene look foggy. It also works with the sunlight coming through the windows that kind of sets the tone for the scene. Baldwin says to get him opening his eyes when his head comes up, and he tells the camera person that they have to go low for that. The door to the church is actually in front of Mr. Baldwin and behind the camera. The witness said Jensen Ackles was just to the left of the camera. Baldwin would be about 20 feet from the door. You also see Dave Halls in the footage. They play another video. It's really the same scene. It looks the same, but Jensen says his lines. Baldwin stops and says again, ready. Jensen repeats his line. Baldwin says one more. They start over. There's some talk among the crew, and they tell Baldwin with this one to draw the gun and look up. Baldwin asks, does he look at the right or left camera? The crew says left. Baldwin says, so whip it out. And the crew member says, yeah, and they call action. Jensen says his lines again, and then there's a long pause. Baldwin pulls the gun from the holster quickly and points it straight ahead, and they do it again. Someone at the end of the second take says, nice. For blocking and the extreme close-up, the witness wasn't expecting him to pull the gun all the way out. He thought it was just to reveal the weapon coming out of the holster to the camera. There were around 12 crew members in the church during blocking. After that last clip, the witness and Reed are trying to find the camera angle that Joel was happy with. Miss Hutchins and Serge were talking about changing the lighting for that turnaround shot. And the witness's boss, who was working on a bounce card, that's used to reflect sunlight coming through the window back onto Baldwin. So the director and Baldwin were talking about the next shot. Alec drew the gun to see what his reaction should be for the director twice. That second time, that gun went off. He said their ears were ringing. There was panic. The first person he looked at was Miss Hutchins, who clearly was injured. He said she quickly went flush and was holding her right side. And he also had Joel screaming from his injury to his shoulder. The witness went to Joel because he was closest to him. Reed and Serge moved a pew out of the way so that they could tend to Miss Hutchins. Now, the witness yelled out, if you can't help, get the F out of here. He said someone called 911. He could hear them talking. He was trying to calm Joel down and tell him that they would get through this because he said he didn't know what else to do. The medic and the best boy electric, which is Serge's second in command, they came into the church and someone named Matt had combat medical training and also came in to assist the set medic. He didn't see Hannah in the church after the gun went off. Baldwin sat down in the same pew that he was filming in. 
when the witness said, if you can't help, get out. At some point, he looked over and Baldwin was gone. He said Joel was wearing a thick hoodie and a t-shirt underneath, and then he started to see the blood come through, and he could see where the injury was. He said he was in pain, but asking how Miss Hutchins was, and he was also coming to the realization he had just been shot. The witness started pulling back his hoodie, revealing that gunshot wound in his shoulder. The witness had blood on his hands. He helped roll Joel over. They cut his shirt off, and the witness saw a bullet just under the skin of the right shoulder blade. So at that point, the medic gave the witness gauze to hold on Joel while they tended to Miss Hutchins. He could hear her groaning, but nothing verbal. At this point in his testimony, he starts to cry, recalling this. He said EMS arrived and she was taken out of the church. He stayed with Joel until they took him out. He did see them working on Miss Hutchins. He heard them call for the life flight, and then he really starts sobbing. He said they were just trying to stabilize her so they could get her out of there. Ultimately, he was told she passed. And when he heard the gunshot and saw them fall, he didn't think in that moment it was a live round, but it became clear when he rolled Joel over and saw a large caliber bullet just barely being held in by his skin. He said he had not seen Hannah after the gun went off until today when he was testifying. The prosecutor asked if he has any reason to believe the camera crew would plant live ammunition before leaving the set. There was an objection and a sidebar. He rephrases that to disgruntled crew members. He said no, he had no reason to believe anybody would do that. The person he believed that loaded that gun was Hannah, and he's asked to identify her in court, which he does. He said he heard no one tell Hannah to leave the church that day. One thing I did forget to tell you, Hannah's attorney, Todd Bullion, he filed a motion for withdrawal. The judge denied that he could leave the case, and also he shall refrain from communicating directly with Hannah Gutierrez-Reed as she requested. There was a new female attorney there today, and I did not see Mr. Bullion, so maybe they just agreed you cannot be there. I didn't see him. Maybe he was there, but it's very interesting when you have a defendant that doesn't even want her defense attorney talking to her, I think that was revealing today of maybe this girl's difficult to work with. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that to request that your attorney, who I thought did a pretty good job for her the last couple of days, not talk to her. You have to wonder what happened. But let's go to Cross because, y'all, it got heated. It got uncomfortable. Oh, it was bad. And I'm going to tell you, yesterday I was singing this defense attorney's praises saying that, He's very effective while being very gentle. Well, that changed today. He went to the dark side and he was very aggressive on cross. And I think the reason, and this is just my theory, and it's probably like not even worth two cents, but I think the witness was so effective in his testimony. He came across as super knowledgeable about the movie industry. This guy's got over 100 credits to his name, 30 years. This isn't his first rodeo. And I think that the emotion that he displayed to the jury when he cried, which was kind of off and on for a little bit of time when recalling the actual shooting, uh, that's going to tickle the heartstrings of this jury and they're going to feel sympathetic for him because it, it's clear those memories were painful to recall. Pretty much the only thing that the defense attorney could do was bring up the fact that this man has sued Russ Productions and Alec Baldwin and then point to things in the lawsuit that he did not say about Hannah that he said on the stand today. But y'all, him and the prosecutor, somebody said they were like an old married couple and it was so true. They were bickering by the end and the judge had to get in the middle. That's how dirty it got. But on cross, he's asked if the other armorers that he's worked with on sets were males. And he says, you're not used to seeing a young 24-year-old armorer, are you? The witness says he's not used to seeing a young 24-year-old armorer, period. The defense says a female. And the witness says that doesn't play into that for him. Male, female, doesn't matter. The defense asks if he's suing Russ Productions and Alec Baldwin, and he says yes. The lawsuit is pending. The defense points out his attorney is in the courtroom and has been watching him on the stand. This is where it gets a little uncomfortable. The defense says, but you haven't sued Hannah. The witness says, you would have to ask my lawyer. The defense asks if he's read his own lawsuit, and he says he's perused it. The defense says, just one page, or, or did you just tell your lawyers, knock yourself out? The witness says, I think I've got past the first page, but I'm not in your industry. I don't understand what a lot of that is. 
and he trusts his lawyer. The defense says it seems you could have read your lawsuit. Well, there is an objection. The defense says he has a totally different story in his lawsuit than what he's testified to today. He asked if he approved that lawsuit. He's suing for punitive damages, loss of enjoyment of life, medical and non-medical expenses. You claim you have a blast injury. He said he's talked to his physician about what happened that day. The defense asked if he's had any tests or x-rays. The witness says he's talked to his physician and his doctor made decisions. The defense asked what that was, and the witness is like, I'm not discussing my medical treatment with you. He said, you're here to tell the jury all about Hannah, but in your lawsuit, you say Russ Productions and Baldwin cut corners and endangered the cast and crew. He said, yes. You said in your lawsuit, hiring two people to manage the budget was not a good idea because of cost-cutting issues on the prior set, and David Halls also had prior safety issues and didn't manage that set safely. And he agrees. The defense says, you knew Hannah asked the budget people for more training days as an armorer. He said he only became aware of that after two people were shot. The defense says it's in your lawsuit. The defense asks if he's hoping if he comes in and testifies and something happens to Hannah, that it would help the lawsuit. He gets a little ticked off here and he says, I'm hoping for justice. Two people were shot on that film set. He said it hasn't only affected him, but also the entire film industry. The defense says your lawsuit didn't say justice. It says money. The state says the defense needs to let the witness answer the questions and also points out he's being argumentative. The defense says, but you're suing for money. He said he asked his attorney to bring justice. The defense points out the safety bulletins weren't posted by first assistant director Halls. The witness says production, and that's all encompassing of all assistant directors. The defense says one of the many jobs of the first assistant director is to ensure safety on set and also to call the safety meetings. He didn't do that daily. The witness says no. The defense says Baldwin didn't follow safety rules. Hannah was in two jobs, one in props and the armorer, and you thought that was dangerous. And you said in your lawsuit, they shouldn't have done that to her. You haven't been on a set where the armorer was part-time, and he says no. The defense says guns were going to be on set 17 of the 21 film days, yet you knew they weren't paying Hannah for more than eight days as an armorer. The witness is like, no clue. He asked if her armor days had run out before the shooting. The dude's like, don't know. He saw on the call sheet she had more than one responsibility. He didn't see her a lot because his job takes focus and he has five bosses at any random time to work with. The defense says, you say you didn't see her in the church. Is that because you were focused? He's like, yeah. They move on to when the discharge with Sarah happened. You said nothing was said. What channel were you on with your radio? And he said, channel eight. The defense says channel one is what the armorer used, and then that goes to the assistant director halls. The witness says, well, if that's so, it's a failure because everyone on set needs to know what's going on with those firearms on set. The defense asked if he knew it was Hall's responsibility to call out there were going to be guns on set. They say the failure wasn't with Hannah. You wanted to imply to the jury that it was Mr. Halls. The witness says that Hannah loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. The defense says, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the discharge with Sarah. Defense goes on to say, you don't know who loaded the firearm. Then he mentions something kind of snarky about his lawsuit. And then he says he talks about all these failures in his testimony. But as far as Hannah, in your lawsuit, it's all about production of Mr. Baldwin. So the defense reads from it and says the reason that Hannah was hired was for a cheap and quick production, hire her cheaper, and make her do two jobs. You heard Baldwin rushing people, telling them to move, move, move. Did you ever say we're not going to rush? He said that's not my job. He didn't see anybody on set stand up to Mr. Baldwin. He doesn't recall anybody standing up to Baldwin about the pace of the filming. The defense says that wasn't going to happen, was it? And then he has to rephrase. You saw how he acted with everyone. Nobody was going to stand up to him because he's the big boss. He's running the show. The witness says, yep, he's number one on the call sheet. He's the producer. He's the writer. And the defense asks, would you see a 24-year-old stand up to him? The witness says he was not in Hannah's position. The defense points out Hannah was not in the union, and the witness says it was a union show and the crew was union. The prosecution interrupts and says that the defense attorney is testifying. So the judge jumps in and says, you're testifying. So he asked the witness if he knew she wasn't union. 
He said he learned after. The defense says with you having 100 credits to your name and you know the union has your back if you stand up, right? The witness says on a union movie, anybody can raise concerns. The defense asked if he thought he could have had production stopped if he saw all these safety issues. He said he could have offered his opinion, but he isn't sure if it would have stopped anything. The defense says you went to Halls in his second second because you were concerned about safety. He said, yeah, and it needed to be on the daily production report, which is is read by producers and the insurance company over the film. He says, you didn't see any change after you complained. He said, well, I wouldn't have, and they would be on channel one having that conversation amongst themselves. He fired back. He did all right, y'all. He said he didn't see any action taken or anything change. The defense says on the day of the shooting, you didn't see Hannah in the church, but you didn't have concerns after the firearm came in the church because the armorer would check that. He said he didn't see Sarah in the church either. Witnesses found out Sarah was loading firearms after after the discharge. The defense says Sarah was Hannah's boss as props master. Props is in charge of ammo, and the witness agrees. The defense says, well, you said earlier guns and ammo are the armorers, but now you say it's props. The witness says live ammo is the armorers. Dummies that go on to belts and bandoliers and things like that are props. And the defense says, well, you say live ammo shouldn't be on a set. The witness says he's talking about blanks. They can go bang and hurt somebody. The defense says, but blanks shoot powder. The defense says you've never been an armorer or props. So when you make opinions about what you think, you really have no idea. It's just what you've seen. The witness says it's what I've learned after 30 years in this industry. He asked if he knew it took over a week to get the props cart on set. The witness says, I'm not in the props department. He just kind of turned around something that the defense attorney just said. I love it. The defense says, you don't know if the firearms on the cart were real or plastic. The witness said they looked real, but if they are firing guns, I don't know. Because in my experience, even a rubber gun goes in a case or a bag, not just laying on the cart. The defense points out they did have socks to put over the guns. The witness doesn't remember seeing them. He's asked if he ever heard Hannah call out the load on Channel 1. And he said, she may have called it out, but you didn't hear it. And if Halls didn't call it out, you're not going to hear it. He said, the protocol is the armorer calls it out verbally. The first assistant director would repeat that. The defense asked, you're going to sit here and tell the jury that Hannah never called out the load? Well, the state objects and says, this isn't something he testified to. The judge sustains that. He's asked if he ever reported this to anyone else since he was so concerned. He said Joel and Miss Hutchins talked about safety issues before she was shot. The defense says, I didn't ask about that. So the witness just keeps going. He notified Local 80. That was the union that represented him while he was there. He's asked when he contacted Local 80. The witness says you would have to contact Local 80 and ask them. It was early on in the filming. The defense says, I'm asking you. I'm not contacting Local 80. The state jumps up says he's already indicated he doesn't remember. The defense asked the judge if he can do his cross-exam, and the prosecutor says, well, yeah, if you do it properly. He says, I am doing it properly. The judge says to ask the question about the date. He doesn't remember the date, but he thinks it was the first week in production. The defense says that's before any accidental discharges, and he doesn't recall if it was before or after, and he talked to them more than once during production. Local 80 contacted the New Mexico local union and then a representative from there showed up and maybe a rep from the local camera union also showed up. He said they had conversations that he was not a part of. The defense brings up that the camera crew was disgruntled about the hotel situation and, and sort of insinuates maybe that's why they left. And also... He mentions Video Village was down. The witness says, I don't know. The defense says, you weren't aware Video Village was down and the state's like, ask an answer. The judge tells him to approach. When they get back and move on, the defense attorney says, you say Baldwin wanted to use the real revolver. He said his understanding was that's how he liked to perform. Baldwin always wanted to roll when he was ready. He would have props in his jacket ready to go. The defense says everyone had to be ready when he was ready, and the witness agrees. They agreed on something, y'all. The defense asked that the scene didn't require the draw. He said his understanding was the extreme close-up was to show Baldwin's hand going into his jacket and then revealing the gun, but not to point the gun. On redirect, they ask, are you the only one suing Russ Productions and Baldwin? No. You say you've lost the enjoyment of your life. Is that right? He gets very teary-eyed and says, yes. He was subpoenaed to be there. 
And then the prosecution says, did anyone force Hannah to take the job as an armorer and a props assistant? He said no. Did anyone force her to keep working on set when it was chaotic? He said no. She asked, is Mr. Baldwin on trial? The witness says it appears he is. Then he says, no, he's not. This is not the trial of the Russ Production Company or Mr. Halls. He says, no. Did Hannah show the dummy rounds to cast and crew as protocol or shake the rounds? He said not while he was on set. She asked, if Hannah had shown the dummy rounds to the cast and crew, what do you think would have happened? Of course, the defense objects. The judge allows the question. He said, if she rattled the dummies and showed it to the cast and crew, you think that live round would have been discovered? The witness says yes. He said if they had looked at the ammo, they would have known if it was a live round or a dummy round. The prosecutor said Hannah decided not to show the dummies before handing the gun to cast and crew. Well, the defense gets up. She asks, is it your understanding Hannah loaded that gun? Yes. In your opinion, would Miss Hutchins be alive today if Hannah hadn't put a live round in the gun? Big objection. That was sustained. Who is the person on set who is in charge of firearms? There's an objection that's sustained. The last question, do you know why your civil lawsuit doesn't include Hannah? He said, you would have to ask my attorney. She asked if he testified today to further his civil suit. He said he testified today to bring justice for the death of his friend. What a great witness. It was like being in a master class on movie sets. I mean, you do a job for 30 years, you know, like the back of your hand. And I'm going to tell you, these are hardworking people on these sets, cast and crew both. Long days, exhausting days, but man, they get it done and lucky us because we get good stuff to watch. But every day is just like such a reminder. This was avoidable, never should have happened. That's it for today. Tomorrow, we'll pick up with day four. We'll see if everybody calms down tonight. People need to go home, take a chill pill or something because it was heated up in there. But the witness held his ground on cross. I was all proud of him because he just seemed very genuine. So I hope he finds his peace. All right, that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good rest of your evening.